Our previous video featured one of my favourite fictional characters, Marcus Clodius Ballista, protagonist of Harry Sidebottom's Warrior of Rome novels, which are set in the midst of the 3rd century crisis. Born Dernhelm, the son of an Angle chieftain, our hero is sent as a hostage to Rome while still a boy. There he assumes the name Marcus Clodius Ballista and builds a successful military career. At the end of the second novel, King of Kings, Ballista is sent out east on a campaign against the Persian Sassanids, and he personally accompanies the Emperor Valerianus to a meeting with Shapur I, resulting in a momentous historical event, one which sets up the plot of the third book, Lion of the Sun. It's in that book in which Sidebottom integrates events from the life of the historical Ballista, aka Callistus, into his fictional hero's story. In this video, we'll explore the ancient sources and see what they have to say about the life and times of the historical Ballista. Welcome to Ancient Classics. The historical or pseudo-historical accounts that we have relating to a ballista or callistus focus on the months following that momentous historical event that I just alluded to, when the Roman Emperor Valerianus came face to face with Shapur I. So who was Shapur? And what was this momentous historical event that I keep alluding to? Well, who better to explain than Shapur's own PR team? In the 1930s, a trilingual inscription written in Persian, Parthian, and Greek was discovered in Iran, northwest of Persepolis. Published in the late 40s or 50s, it's sometimes known by the Latin title Res Gestae Divi Saporis, the achievements of the divine Shapur. No particular reason, it's not even written in Latin. I'll quote from the Greek text. I am the divine Sapor, worshipper of Mazda, king of kings of the Aryans and non-Aryans, descendant of gods, son of the divine Artaxeros, worshipper of Mazda, king of kings, descendant of gods, born of the divine king Papakos. I am the master of the tribes of Aryans, and I control these people, Persia, Parthia, Huzini, Messanini, Assyria, Adiabini, Adubadini, Armenia, Iberia, Macalonia, Albania, so far as the Caucasus and the gates of the Albanians and all the mountains. We established mastery over these tribes and their leaders from all parts and made them pay tribute to us. A great battle took place off of Carre and Edessa between us and Caesar Valerianus, and we took Caesar Valerianus captive with our own hands together with the rest of them, the Praetorian Prefect, the Senators, Generals, and the Officers of the Army. We overpowered them all by hand and took them back to Perseus. So the Roman Emperor Valerianus was taken captive by Shapur I, King of Kings, Emperor of the Sassanid Empire. This probably took place in or around 260 AD and is attested to by many Greco-Roman sources. Valerianus was paraded around and ritually humiliated for the rest of his life. Sources vary as to when and how his life ended. Either he was killed, perhaps by flaying, or by being forced to drink molten gold. I wonder if that inspired George R. R. Martin's depiction of the death of Danny's brother, whatever his name is, in Game of Thrones. Though perhaps Valerianus just died of natural causes, but still in captivity. So what role did the real-life Ballista play in this? No surviving account suggests that Ballista was there at the capture of Valerianus, although Chapeau's inscription does state that several senior officers and members of Valerianus' staff were taken captive alongside the emperor, including his epakos, the Greek term usually used to translate the Roman term praefectus. Ballista, or Callistus as he's sometimes called, is mentioned by name in three other texts, or five depending on how you count them, and he is alluded to by one other. But none of those texts are both contemporary and reliable. Perhaps our two best sources come from Byzantine authors. The first is Giorgio Sinkelos, or George the Cellmate, who was writing perhaps in the early 9th century, and John Zonaras, who was active in the 12th century, i.e. between 500 and 900 years after the event. 
Both Syncellus and Zonaras wrote summaries or epitomes of history going way back from Old Testament times through to more recent times. Both, though, were working from more contemporary accounts, which have since been lost, so they're actually probably the best sources for this scantily evidenced period. Of the two, Zonaras is the most detailed source. Watch out, he calls our guy Callistus at one point and then switches to Ballista without either explaining why nor indicating that they are the same guy, but don't worry about that. The first passage that I'll read describes what happened after Valerianus had been taken captive by Shapur, and Shapur's armies are ransacking the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire. Now then, the Romans who had fled, so it is said, appointed a certain Callistus as their general. When he had observed the Persians dispersing and recklessly attacking the territories because they did not think that anyone would oppose them, he quickly attacked them. He wrought a massive slaughter of the barbarians and captured the concubines of Sapor, together with much wealth. So he, Chapeau, greatly pained by these things, turned hastily homeward, bringing along Valerianus, who ended his life in Persia, reviled and mocked as a captive. Syncellus has a similar account, again picking up from the incursions of the Persians against Roman-held territory after the capture of Valerianus. At that time, the Persians, through their greed, were scattered in different places. And as they were on the verge of seizing Pompeiopolis Maritima and were plundering Lycaonia, they were destroyed in a very large number when Callistus, the Roman general whom the Romans had made their leader while in flight, launched an unexpected naval attack against them with his forces. After seizing Shapur's concubines and a great deal of wealth, he departed with his fleet to Sevaste and Korikos, where he killed 3,000 Persians. Let's step back and fill in what had been happening in the Roman imperial succession at the time. Following the capture of Valerianus, Valerianus's son Gallienus assumed power, but certainly not without challenge or rivals, because meanwhile, Valerianus's staff officer Titus Fulvius Macrianus, or Macrinus made a bid for power through his two sons, Quirtus or Quintus, and Macrianus Jr. At this point, Zonaras introduces Ballista under that name. Another war against Gallienus was incited by Macrinus, who, having two sons, Macrianus and Quintus, attempted a usurpation. Because he was lame in one leg, he did not don the imperial mantle, but clad his sons in it. The people of Asia joyfully received him. After he had lingered a little on the Persian front, he began to make preparations about Gallienus and appointed Ballista, whom he selected cavalry commander to face the Persians and left behind his son Quintus with him. So at this point, Ballista is fighting for Quietus, the usurper emperor, puppet of his father Macrianus. Enter Odonathos, boss of Palmyra, who over the previous few years had established himself as a major player in the region, assisting the emperor Gallienus, but increasingly powerful in his own right. For sure, Quintus, the youngest son of Macrinus, was in the east with Ballista, and had made almost all of it subject to himself. Against them, Gallienus sent Odonathos, who was in command of the people of Palmyra. When the defeat of the Macrini, which had occurred in Pannonia, was announced to Quintus and Ballista, many of the cities under them rebelled. They were quartered in a mesa. When he arrived there, Odonathus attacked them, was victorious, and executed Ballista. Okay, so those are our Byzantine sources. The other main text, or set of texts, depending on how you look at it, is the Historia Augusta, a kind of latter-day lives of Caesars, written in Latin, purportedly by various authors around 300 AD. Now, many scholars doubt the reliability and authenticity of the Historia, although I don't think there's any doubt that the text dates back to late antiquity, the 5th century at the latest. Sidebottom himself is of the view that the Historia Augusta was written by a single person around 400 AD, and in Sidebottom's words, by the time the unknown author reached the 3rd mid-century, he was writing free historical fiction. So, 
make of it what you will. Even so, the Historia Augusta has the most material on Ballista, and Sidebottom made full use of it. Recall how, after his capture, Valerianus was succeeded by his son Gallienus, only to be challenged by Macrianus and sons. We hear how, according to Zonaras, Ballista fought on the side of Macrianus and his sons, but was defeated and killed by Odenathos. Well, the Historia Augusta has a somewhat more ambiguous take. Most references to Ballista in the Historia Augusta are found in the book known as the Thirty Tyrants, attributed to a certain Trebellius Pollio. The section therein on Macrianus describes the role that Ballista supposedly played in bringing Macrianus Jr. and Quietus to power, and in this section we also hear that Ballista has previously served as Valerianus' prefect. After Valerianus' capture, Ballista, Valerianus' prefect, and Macrianus, the foremost of his generals, since they knew that Gallienus was worthy only of contempt, and since the soldiers too were seeking an emperor, withdrew together to a certain place to consider what should be done. Then. They agreed that since Gallienus was far away and Ariolus was usurping the imperial power, some emperor ought to be chosen, and indeed the best man, so that no usurper would arise. Therefore, Ballista, or so Myonius Estiniax, who took part in their council reports, spoke as follows to Macrianus As for myself, my age and my occupation and my desires are all far removed from the imperial office, and so I cannot deny I am searching for a worthy emperor. But who honestly is there who can fill the place of Valerianus, except a man such as yourself, brave, steadfast, honourable, experienced in public affairs, and, what is of the highest importance for holding the imperial office, wealthy? Therefore, take this post, which your merits deserve. My services as prefect will be yours as long as you wish. Only serve the Republic well, so that the Roman world may rejoice that you have been made its ruler. Macrianus claims to be too old and frail to assume power. Ballista, perceiving that Macrianus, speaking in this way, seemed to have in mind his own two sons, answered him as follows. To your wisdom, then, we entrust the Republic. And so give us your sons, Macrianus and Quietus, most courageous young men, made tribunes by Valerianus a long time ago. For, under the rule of Gallienus, because they are good men, they cannot remain unharmed. Then Macrianus, finding out that his thoughts had been understood, replied, I yield, and from my own funds I will present to the soldiers a double payment. You must only give me your service as prefect and furnish rations in the necessary places. I will now do my best that Gallienus, more contemptible than any woman, may come to know his father's generals. And so, with the consent of all the soldiers, Macrianus was made emperor, together with his two sons, Macrianus and Quietus, and he immediately proceeded to march against Gallienus. That text, The Thirty Tyrants, consistent with Zonaris's take, describes how Ballista was subsequently put to death by Odenathus, who fought against Macrianus and Quietus. Quietus, as we have said, was the son of Macrianus and was made emperor along with his father and brother in accordance with the judgment of Ballista. But when Odenathus, who had held the east for some time now, learned that the two Macriani, the father and brother of Quietus, had been defeated by Ariolus, and that their soldiers had yielded to his power in the belief that he was upholding the cause of Gallienus, he put the young man to death along with Ballista, who had been prefect for a long time. But then, in a later section referring to Odenathos, the author of the Thirty Tyrants returns to Odenathos' attack on Quietus and Ballista and drops a bombshell. Then, Odenathus turned to the eastern provinces, hoping to be able to crush Macrianus. After Macrianus was killed, Odenathus killed his son Quietus too. While Ballista, many assert, usurped the imperial power in order that he too might not be killed. In this section, the author is unclear as to Ballista's fate, having asserted that he was killed by Odenathus just a few chapters back. But he states that Ballista somehow assumed the purple was proclaimed emperor as a defensive tactic. Hmm. So, Ballista as emperor. Well, Ballista gets his own chapter in the Thirty Tyrants too, and the story becomes even more muddled. Historians do not agree whether Ballista held the imperial power or not. 
it. For many assert that when Quietus was killed by Odenathos, Ballista was pardoned, but nevertheless took the imperial power because he did not trust Gallienus or Areolus or Odenathos. Others again declare that while still a private individual, he was killed on the lands which he had bought for himself near Daphne. Many indeed have said that he assumed the purple in order to rule in the Roman fashion, and that he took command of the army and made many promises on his own account, but was killed by those dispatched by Areolus for the purpose of seizing Quietus Macrianus's son, whom Areolus claimed was his own prize. Ballista was a notable man, skilled in administering the state, energetic in council, winning fame in campaigns, without an equal in providing for rations. The chapter on Ballista then goes off on a tangent by citing a letter from the Emperor Valerianus praising the administrative skills of Ballista. Recall that Ballista supposedly served as Valerianus's prefect. Then the biography of Ballista, such as it is, ends with a description of his death. This man then, when resting in his tent, was killed, it is said, by a certain common soldier in order to gain the favour of Odenathus and Gallienus. I, however, have not been able to find the truth about him sufficiently because the writers of his time have said much about his prefecture, but little about his rule. Ballista also makes an appearance in another book within the Historia Augusta, The Two Galliani, which is also attributed to Trebellius Pollio, the person who supposedly wrote The Thirty Tyrants, that is. The references to Ballista in that book are broadly consistent with those in The Thirty Tyrants, although the book does not mention anything about Ballista assuming imperial command. It does say that Ballista, though working for Macrianus at first, turned on Quietus and may have had a hand in his killing just before joining Odenathos. Meanwhile, when the Republic had been thrown into confusion throughout the entire world, Odenathos, learning that Macrianus and his son had been killed, and that Aureolus was ruling, and that Gallienus was administering the state with still greater lethargy, hastened forward to seize the other son of Macrianus together with his army, should fortune permit it. But those who were with Macrianus's son, whose name was Quietus, took the side of Odenathos by the instigation of Ballista, Macrianus's prefect. They killed the young man, and throwing his body over the wall in large numbers, they all surrendered to Odenathos. And so, Odenathos was made emperor over almost the whole east, while Aureolus held Illyricum and Gallienus Rome. The same Ballista murdered many of the people of Emesa, where Macrianus's soldiers, along with Quietus and the guardian of his treasures, had fled, with the result that this city was nearly destroyed. Odenathus, meanwhile, as if taking the side of Gallienus, was ensuring that everything that had happened was announced to him truthfully. We have one final text that alludes to Ballista. And if the Historia Augusta has a bad rep as a historical source, well, um, we're really scraping the credibility barrel here. Because this final source is a prophetic text, the 13th Sibylline Oracle. Huh? A Sibylline Oracle as a historical text? Yeah, I was confused when I kept on seeing references to it when I was researching this video. But to quote Potter, the Oracle is not only the sole surviving contemporary narrative account of the years AD 240 to 60 from within the Roman Empire, it is also one of the rare pictures that we have of Roman history in any period from the pen of a provincial who had no obvious connection with the government. The 13th Sibylline Oracle is therefore an unusual example of popular history, history from the perspective of the man on the street. We are particularly fortunate that this man in the street was reflecting upon a time of great drama in the history of the empire. We can see the history of these years through the eyes of a victim of the campaigns of Chapeau I, which shook the government of Rome to its core. So what does the oracle have to say about Ballista? Well, being a pseudo-mystic text, it's all in code. The oracle tells us of the rout of the Romans, presumably referring to Valerianus's capture, then foretells that Another will come, a well-horned, hungry stag in the mountains desiring to feed his stomach with the venom-spitting beast. Then will come the sun-sent, dreadful, fearful lion, breathing much fire. 
With great and reckless courage he will destroy the well-horned swift stag, and the great venom-spitting fearsome beast discharging many shafts, and the bow-footed goat. Fame will attend him, perfect, unblemished, and awesome. He will rule the Romans, and the Persians will be feeble. The sun-sent lion is apparently Odinathos, lions being a symbol of the gods of Palmyra. Indeed, the title of the third ballista book, Lion of the Sun, is a reference to Odinathos. The well-horned swift stag is uh, apparently Macrianus. The venom-spitting beast, a snake, is Shapur. And the bow-footed goat, Toxobaten Tragon, is Ballista. Why? Well, bow-footed goat, bow, toxos, ballista is like a giant bow thing. Uh, let's see what he did there. So yeah, thanks Sybil, that's very enlightening. Well anyway, the sources are all an inconsistent, sometimes incoherent mess. It seems that Ballista, or Callistus, was Valerianus' Praetorian Prefect. A Praetorian Prefect was captured alongside Valerianus by Shapur, but he is not named. After the capture of Valerianus, Ballista sides with Macrianus and plays a role in the appointment of Macrianus' sons, Macrianus Jr. and Quietus, as rival emperors to Valerian's son Gallienus. Then Ballista wages war against the Sassanid Persian army of Shapur, by some accounts even capturing Shapur's harem, although the historian Augusta attributes that act to Odinathos. Then, and this is where the sources are really mixed, there's some kind of denouement with Odinathos. Something happens in the city of Emesa, modern-day Homs, where Quietus is then stationed. Odinathos defeats Quietus. Accounts vary as to Ballista's role in that. Ballista seems to have been somehow involved in Quietus's death, and by some accounts, Ballista may even have been proclaimed emperor or appointed himself as emperor as some kind of defensive tactic. By some accounts, Ballista is then killed by Odinathos. By others, he is spared or even goes over to Odinathos' side, in which case he may have died years later, perhaps murdered in his tent. In the next video in the series, we'll see how Sidebottom integrates those events into the story of his fictional Ballista and how the the character of Ballista then develops in subsequent novels after the historical material about his namesake runs out, if you like. In the meantime, like and subscribe and we'll be back soon.